Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Good evening. My guest this evening is Karan Thapa, known as the angry young, well, not so young, angry youngish oldish television interviewer, has had a stellar track record of interviewing people, pissing a lot of people off, making them walk away. And his cast is a cast of luminaries. Jai Lalitha has refused to shake his hand, otherwise she shook every hand that either offered friendship or, you know what, in terms of, you know, money, I hope. Narendra Modi walked off pretending to ask for water and refused to come back. And here was poor Karan Thapa in the, in the middle of the interview, not wondering whether it was a lack of water or what Karan had said. So Karan has always had this innate ability to anger people. I've known him for almost three decades now. He's never angered me. I've never been upset, but I've always been curious. Is there a decent bone in this man's body when he is on camera? I know there are many when he is off camera. So that's why we're having this splendid year of the end of the year chat with Karan Thapa. Karan, welcome to your show. Thank you very much indeed. And welcome to asking me questions. Why do you piss people off? Why do you get people all antsy? Why are you always angry? I don't think I'm always angry, but yes, you're absolutely right. I frequently piss people off. And that's probably a combination of three things. For some, it's my manner, my behavior, even my appearance. For others, it's the way I ask questions. Not necessarily the content, but the belligerence of the tone, the pointing of the finger, the accusation that seems to come across. And for a third lot of people, it's just that I don't think they like Karan. But you went to a decent school, didn't people? I went at to a superb school? school, by the way. Well, didn't people at Dune School tell you finger pointing is not a good thing? Um, yes, they did, but we all pointed fingers, so no one knew who they were pointing it at. No, but there's obviously one thing that I will say in your favor is that you're extremely well researched. Do you come to an interview prepared to make the interviewee fail, feel miserable, get upset? What's your end objective? I don't come to an interview intending to make the interview fail. That would be impertinent on my part. It would be pretty close to presumptuous on my part. But I do come intending to give the interviewee a tough time because if there are issues on which he's taken a position or she's taken a position which is unviable, which is based upon poor research on his or her part, the object is to expose it. So yes, the research is designed to do precisely that. And more than the research, the questions are structured in a way in which you sort of anticipate what the answer will be so that you devise the second and the third to proceed down the road you want to go. So yes, the research is done, the structuring is done, and the intention is, I know it sounds awful to say it, but to expose to suggest to the audience pretty clearly that the person I'm talking to is not sure of what he's saying, he's unprepared, he hasn't thought it through, or he's sometimes just wrong. That is the object of the interview. And that's not just Karan doing it. Any current affairs interviewer anywhere in the world would approach a subject in the same way. But people say that with Karan, there's always an underlying agenda, that you're very kind to people who are like you, <clears throat> and you're very unkind to people who aren't. Uh, for instance, 
people will say that, you know, you don't suffer fools, and especially fools who are from the vernacular world. What do you have to say to that? But the problem about people from the vernacular world is they and I don't speak the same language, so I'd very rarely be in a position to interview them. I wish I could speak Hindi fluently enough to conduct an interview. The only time I've done an interview which was pretty close to 40-45% Hindi because he was being kind to me and he was accepting and tolerating my appalling Hindi was Satpal Malik. But with that exception, practically all the interviews I do are entirely in English. There may be the odd phrase or sentence in Hindi. Malik was the first interview where pretty close to 45% was Hindi. But as I said, he was kind enough to accept my intolerable Hindi, excuse my mistakes and continue to speak as if what I had said made genuine sense. But while on the subject of Satpal Malik, there was a time when you were very close to LK Advani. And I won't say you were right wing, but you were pretty neutral, you were pretty tolerant of the BJP then. Something snapped, that's what people think. And you are now virulently against the current dispensation. But that's not LK Advani. That's yes. not LK Advani. So was it only LK Advani that you were fond of and as a result, you were pretty neutral towards the BJP? Or is there something that you hate about Narendra Modi? What is it that really angers you about him? Because, you know, <clears throat> there's a perceptible bitterness, there's anger, there's almost a feeling that, look, he may be India's prime minister, but he's not my prime minister. So here's an opportunity for you to clarify it. Absolutely. He is very much my prime minister. I acknowledge him as my prime minister. Never for a moment would I say he's not my prime minister. But God, do I wish he wasn't my prime minister. Why? And I'll tell you. I think what I hold against Mr. Modi more than anything else is the fact that he has divided and polarized our country. He has followed a policy whereby the othering of Muslims has become exceptional, sorry, acceptable, it's the norm. He's brought out the worst in us, it was latent in us, no doubt, but he's made the expression of hatred and dislike. Where do you find a government where ministers are constantly saying to Muslims, Babar ki aulad? Where do you find chief ministers who taunt them and say, Abba Jaan? Where do you find ministers who say to their own countrymen, go to Pakistan? Look at the BJP. This is the first time the ruling party doesn't have a single Muslim Lok Sabha MP, not a single Rajya Sabha MP, not a single minister who is Muslim. Look at the facts. They fought elections in Uttar Pradesh. Twice they've won. They don't have a single Muslim MLA. MLC they may have, but not a single MLA. In Karnataka, 14% Muslim population, not a single Muslim MLA. In Gujarat, with a 9% Muslim population, you have not had a candidate who is Muslim in any election, Vidhan Sabha or Lok Sabha, for 25 years. It is that other... For 25 years, right? That's a very <clears throat> long time. Per 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 perfect. 25 years. So why are the 10 years of Modi such a red flag if it had already been happening for 14 years or, you know, 15 years because before that? Modi brought it to the forefront in a way in which it never was there before. Think about it. Abba Jan, Babar Ki Aulad, Go to Pakistan, Hemant Kumar Biswas, the Chief Minister of Assam, or even a man called Ashwara, who was the Deputy Chief Minister of Karnataka, have publicly said in rallies, we don't need Muslims, we don't want Muslim votes. That has all happened under Muslim. Fair right? enough. Right? Does that but say something about us? Let, let, me, let me quickly come back to Advani and then I'll come to your question about us. And yes, it does say something about us as a people, but on Advani, on Vajpayee, it wasn't just the two of them. In that generation of politicians, people who were close to me and I got on well with, George Fernandez, sure. Ritesh Kumar, right? They were people that were like us. I understood them. I liked them. I dined with them. They came over to my home. And to this day, I admire L.K. Advani enormously. Yes, I'm not as close to him as I was. I've written about it in my book. I've explained it at great length. But I admire him hugely. I admired Vajpayee to the day he died. As to your question, does it reflect something about us? Yes, it does. Clearly, somewhere in us as people, there was latent dislike of Islam, latent dislike of Muslims. It has been made acceptable in a way in which it never was. Previously, those are emotions that were suppressed. Suppressed to such an extent, they were never expressed. They weren't even things that we were obviously conscious of. Now people flaunt their anti-Islamic sentiment. And that is what I hold against Mr. Modi. Not his running of the economy. I think some ways he's done a lot for the economy that is good. Maybe not the unemployment side of it, but those who make money are doing extremely well. 
I think he's done a lot for welfare. He's done a lot to give people money, particularly the most poor. The direct benefit transfers have made cut out corruption. For all of that, I give him praise. Muslim women? Muslim women in particular. So but therefore, think, he's not anti-Muslim? I, I don't think it's Muslim women that he's anti Triple or not talaq? anti. No. By the way, Triple Talaq was not Modi. It was the Supreme Court who struck it down. All Mr. Modi did was to very unfairly criminalize it. And what is Triple Talaq? It is abandonment of your wife. But Hindus can abandon their wives. Christians can abandon their wives and do. So can Jains, so can Buddhists. They aren't criminalized. Only in the case of Muslims is this. So the criminalizing of Triple Talaq, I think, was extremely unfair and unnecessary. But the act of making it illegal was the Supreme Court, not Modi. Yes, but it was the same Supreme Court which voted or which pronounced judgments in favor of Shah Bano, which Rajiv Gandhi then overturned through parliament. And it was a terrible mistake on Rajiv so Gandhi's part. So appeasement of communities has existed. My question here, Karan, is Narendra Modi has not sneaked in through the back door. No, without He's doubt. been elected by the people of this country. Everyone has an opinion. Okay, he's done this against the Muslims. He's done this for minorities. He's done that against the... But the point is that he's an elected prime minister. There is no question in anyone's mind that he's also the target of revulsion by a certain kind of people. You and I would refer to them as wokes or left liberals or whatever. In the process, what's happening is brand India is being damaged. The narrative that is being played out is exactly what you said. No one refers to Gandhi in Noah Khali can, before can I, independence. Can I, can I interrupt and say, I don't think brand image is damaged by... No, what brand you call, India. I don't think brand India is damaged by what you call the revulsion of Modi. I think brand India is damaged by some of the practices of Modi. When journalists are held up for sedition because they're simply critical of the government or the prime minister, that damages brand India. When there are calls for genocide of Muslims at a dharma sansa of all wretched places and the <laughs> government is silent, right? That damages brand India. When politicians are targeted through the ED or through the CBI, and they all happen to be opposition politicians, and absolutely no one from the government is ever targeted, that damages brand India. The damaging of brand India is done probably more by the policies this government follows. I think in the eyes of many people, the opposition to those policies is an attempt to revive the old India, the credible India, the democratic India that we adore. It's the damage to India's democracy, to our institutions, to the way in which the election commission is appointed, to the way in which parliament is treated, to the way in which the newspapers are handled, to the way in which our television has become, to use the common phrase, Godi TV. That damages brand India, not the opposition to it. So where you're sitting and you're meeting a diverse set of people, where do you think is the solution? The solution is, it's not Modi's business to go looking for an opposition. It's the opposition's business to become a responsible, electable opposition in this country. So what are we missing? A good, credible opposition that fails on two counts. First of all, we do not have a central figure to put against Mr. Modi. So when the question used to be asked in Heru's days after Nehru, who? Wells Hangen asked the question, much the same question can be asked today of Modi, other than Modi who? So that's the first failing of the opposition. We do not have a single... Rahul Gandhi? Gun. I don't think Rahul matches up to, Rahul, to Narendra Modi, and Why? I'm not being unfair to him. I think he lacks the gravitas. I think he lacks the political nouns that is so important. I don't think he has the flair. He's probably a much nicer person than Modi, without any doubt, and probably a better friend to most people. But he doesn't have the qualities that a leading politician does. But I think there's something else the opposition So is he have. coming in the way of the Congress? No, I think other things are coming in the way. Congress doesn't have an answer to the three things that work for Modi. Nationalism, majoritarianism, which is another word for Hindutva, and welfareism. If you simply try and target Modi, and therefore try and target the government with calls like Rafal, Chokidar, yeah, Chorhai, Purnoti, Modi, they don't work. And if you continue with it, you're simply pursuing something that is already failed. So why do they? So it's an ideological answer that's missing in addition to the individual that's missing. But there is a third thing. And the third thing is the intangible. Modi has captured the imagination of this country. Good or bad, I don't deny it. Absolutely. He is by far the most popular person in the country today. Polls suggest that 70 to 80 percent of this country, probably around 77 percent, think he is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and that is a fact of the matter we have to live with. It is also a reflection of the way we perceive our leaders. We want strong men. We want a Hindu leader. We also clearly want 
a man who cuts short corners to deliver goods, who is nationalistic in the way in which he believes that he's thrashing Pakistan, he believes he's thrashing China, not that he's doing either of the two, but that image works for him. And at this moment, the country is entranced by it. That is something that the opposition does know how to break. At some point, it will end. These are not... Enduring. And also, these are not magnetic images that last forever. They will fade away with time, but they're not fading at the moment. But that's what people say, that it would take one term, two terms, but he's in. It's a shoe in for a third term. Yes so and what no. is going to stop him? Yes and no. Think about it. On the third term, you have a very interesting position. Look at the map of India as it exists after the last set of by-elections. Yeah. From South India, there is a corridor. The whole of South India is outside the hands of Mr. Modi, and there's a corridor via the east. Bihar, Orissa, Bengal, and then up, there's also Mizoram. Right? There is a corridor that surrounds Mr. Modi that is outside his hands. The majority of Modi's support is in northern India, the Hindi heartland and the west. And in the west also, by the way, he has only an alliance in Maharashtra, but Gujarat is entirely his. If in those areas, including in the east, Modi's number of seats can come down, and it's not that hard to believe they can. He has 18 in Bengal if he can lose 8 or 9. He has 17 in Bihar if he can lose 7 or 10. He has very few in Odisha if he can lose one or two of those. I think he's got a 10 if ten. he can lose one or two of those. But he's got the those. alliance there. Right? Well, Your friend, who, knows, who knows how Naveen will behave if Modi falls below to 72. If in addition to the 25, 30 that I've talked about in East India, he can lose 10 or 12 in Northern India, which may not be impossible, right? Then Mr. Modi will be below to 72 and he could be in trouble. He will still be by far the single largest party, but he'll be dependent upon allies to form a government. Would that strong, dominant, authoritarian, I'm not saying autocratic, but authoritarian leader that we're used to be happy where he's dependent upon allies to keep his position going? Because then he'll have to defer to what they want, not just in terms of cabinet, in terms of his manner, in terms of his behavior, in terms in which he runs the country. That may be difficult and problematic for him. And think about it. Of the seats that he has, how many more can he get in UP? How many yeah. more can he get in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan? How many more can he get in Chhattisgarh? Of those three, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, there are 65 Lok Sabha seats. He has 62 already. So winning at the state level may not necessarily improve his prospects at the Lok Sabha level. That's why I'm saying it's not beyond the realm of possibility. But, and the but is a very important but, Modi so dominates, dominates the thinking of our country that when it comes to a national election, people will vote in terms of Modi. And if that factor carries the weight it did in 2019, he could sweep once again, regardless of everything that I've just said to you. So, if you were to predict, how many seats on this day would you give Narendra Modi in 2024? I won't predict, but I'll say my hunch is that Mr. Modi could come in anywhere between, at the low side, 250, 255. At the high side, I would say 285, 290. So he'll be prime minister? He will be prime minister for sure if he gets between 272 and 290. If he's below 272, he will be the biggest party. He could certainly find allies to be prime minister. But would he want to be a very different prime minister? Would he want to accept that? constraint on his authority, because when you have allies, they are a constraint. Would he opt out himself? Would he want to sully, that's my term, would he want to spoil the record he's had for 10 years by suddenly being a different prime minister for the remaining three or four? I'm not sure. So let's, let's park the, the 2024. And one other thing, if Mr. Modi falls below 272, I think he's big enough to say that this is a vote against me personally. And he would achieve a huge kudos if he said, I may have the single biggest party, I don't have a majority, that I interpret as a vote against me, I'm opting out, the country needs someone else. He'd probably be begged by his party in a large section of the country to change his mind and come back. But that might be a gamble that he'd take, and it would be a winning moral gambit as well. Not just a gamble, but a gambit. I think if he did that, his stature would shoot up. It would be the first time a man with a single majority after Sonia Gandhi Sonia. could opt out and say... But Sonia gave it me. to someone else. He, well, he would give it to someone else too because it would still be someone in the party that would take over, whether it's Gadkari, whether it's Amit Shah, whether it's uh, the gentleman from UP, who knows. But <laughs> he would clearly gain moral stature if he said, I'm below 272, I interpret that as a vote against me. 
be honest with me. Have you ever tried to make inroads with people in government? Have you reached out to them saying, look, I'm not the, the person who's eternally I'm not the Rakshas off. and the monster that you I'm not the you Rakshas. Have you, have, you, have you tried to reach out to these guys? Because I think a journalist's job is to be available and make others available irrespective of their party frequently, you know, alliances. Frequently. Not only, they said. I'll tell you. Not only have I written at great length in the last chapter of my book, the extent that I went to try to ensure that whatever the problem with Modi was, was rectified. But even after that failed, when the last election happened, 2019, I think I must have written this, I'm saying it from memory, two, maybe three letters to say, look, we've had our problems, but for both our interests, we need to put them behind us. You need to be interviewed, you need to be understand, I need to interview people like you. Let's turn a page and start afresh. Those letters were never replied to. What more can a journalist do than to ask people to give him interviews? If the person decides he, hasn't, he isn't willing to do so, that's his prerogative. Do you, and I accept that. So do you think that perhaps Modi's at a stage where he doesn't think you're relevant? Very possibly. He probably thinks I'm utterly irrelevant. <laughs> but by the way, if you boycott someone, then they can't be that irrelevant because a boycott is a deliberate act to negate someone. And you only negate people who you think are important enough to negate. So let's get back to a very interesting thing that you tucked away in your, in your answers about Godi media. The word Godi media was given by people who were not Godi media, obviously. And we now see that Godi media is all pervasive. There's ownership of media. By the way, this ownership existed even at the time of independence. Sure. You had large industrialists, that, that. big companies owning uh, newspapers. Birlas for a start, yeah. the Bennett's, the, the, the Jains. And the only people who were part of a trust the were the statesmen. The Telegraph, the Sarkars. What do you think has changed in the media today? The media was supplicant then, and the media today, if you believe so, is supplicant now. Yes, you have exceptions. Let me, let me, let me answer your question. What is that one thing that has changed? Let me answer your question specifically with reference to television. I think what happens in television is twofold. Number one, television also follows the government's practice of othering minorities. You'll see it happening there. And what makes it even worse is that anchors don't ask questions. They badger you until you agree with the, what they're suggesting or what they're alluding to. That never happened previously. The object of discussions was to ask people with different opinions, solicit different opinions and leave it to the audience to decide. Not badger people whose opinion you don't like. That is one reason why it's called Godi Media because the opinion that they're badgering you to like is reflective of the government. The second thing that's happened is that these are channels that interview people from the government very differently in style, tone, content and manner than they do people from the opposition. People from the opposition are almost harassed and harangued. People from the government are treated on bended knee. But they are all, all doing it. Some of them are your very close friends. Some of them went to the same school. Then they are equally wrong to do it then they're equally wrong to do it and I wouldn't defend them. But I think the third thing that has happened, which is equally bad, is that what you don't have is a sense of questioning, right? When you're interviewing the prime minister, and he's been interviewed fairly frequently, the question is not to ask him, the opposition says A, B, C, D, how do you defend yourself? The question is the opposition says A, B, C, D, how wrong do you think they are? The two are very different questions. One is to give him a platform where he has to defend himself. The other is to give him a platform where he can accuse the opposition of being accusatory of him. And they do the second. That is but, not how you interview a prime minister anywhere in the world. Sure, but could it be in Modi or anyone's head in the ruling party or in the government that if we ever speak to Karan, he will be like that proverbial person which we used to say, talk about in Calcutta. He'll have a problem for every solution that you will sit there and nitpick and nitpick and only find fault. But Although today you've been pretty generous about the government's achievements. Let me tell you something. I think that is the job of a good journalist. When you interview someone as a politician, you do it naturally from the devil's advocate point of view. You don't endorse and support what they're doing. You put to them the problems with the policies they're pursuing. And it's not that those problems don't exist. They're real problems. But in putting those problems to them, you're doing two things. A, you're making the audience aware. B, and more importantly, you're giving them a chance to respond to those concerns. As a good politician, they are also aware that their policies aren't perfect. And they want an opportunity to say, this is how I'll correct that. This is how this should be understood. That is a misperception. Those are opportunities for them to correct 
the wrong way their policies are viewed. But if they take it simply as criticism, if they take it simply as an attack on themselves, they're missing an opportunity. Look, there is a symbiotic relationship between all journalists and politicians. One, they feed off each other. Absolutely. But they must never become friends with each other. But you've been friends with so many. And the danger is when you do become friends with people, your capacity to question them objectively and sometimes toughly gets diminished by the fact that there's an understanding. And I'll give you the classic example. I've written about it, Benazir Bhutto. We were yes, at she university. was a great friend of yours. A great friend of mine. We were at university together. She was absolutely terrific when my wife Nisha died. So I owe an awful lot to her personally. Whenever we do an interview, the expectation on her part is Karan is a friend, he understands the problems, he won't push beyond a certain point. Karan, on the other hand, is a journalist, she's the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Karan's very conscious. That's the point beyond which I have to go. There'll be an inherent, inevitable clash in the perceptions of the two sides when they approach the thing. Which is why whenever an interview with her ended, she would always laugh and say, before you go anywhere, you're having an ice cream with me, you need to cool down and so do I, because otherwise we find it difficult to chat later. What she was really saying was, Let's make up and get over this because it has to happen quickly, otherwise it rankles. And she never let it rankle, but that was her greatness, right? But I think as a policy, you should never become too close. You can be friendly with. Friendly with means being polite, it means being amicable, it means being sociable. But to become friends with, where you dine with each other, you share uh, confidences with each other, that is a mistake. But tell me, ironic as it is, you were a great pal of, great friend of Mr. Advani's. You do know that this whole Babri Masjid, the Rath Yatra was all his brainchild. In many ways, people say, I don't say it, but many ways, in many ways people say that he was the one who sowed the seeds of this looking at Muslims differently. You had no issues with that. Why would you have an issue with Modi? I did have issues with that, if issues is the correct way of phrasing it. I remember an interview I did with him in February of 98, that would have been about six weeks before the BJP came to power for the very first time. And I said to him, the interview which was being conducted on his home, I said, Aapne rakshas ke sir se seen ukhaar ke muh pe muskarat dha diya, lekin badla kya. So what did he say? Right? He said absolutely nothing for the first 10 minutes. There was a commercial break. He walked out of the room. I thought he'd gone to have a pee or something and he didn't return. When he had returned for four or five minutes, I walked up to the next door room and I said, what's happened? You haven't come back. And he said, but if you think I'm a raptor, what's the point of talking to me? And I said, oh, Mr. Vani, that was just a turn of phrase and nothing more. I didn't mean to be offensive. I was simply saying that you are deliberately changing the raptor's image of the BJP into a softer, gentler image to make yourself politically more electable. And he understood and he walked back in. And when he sat down, he did something for which I will never cease to praise him got up from his chair after he sat down and he went to every single member of the crew and he said, I'm terribly sorry, I made a horrible mistake, forgive me. Horrible mistake of what? For having walked out. Ah. And he sat down and he continued the interview. And I'll give you one more example. This particular example was February 1998. My very first interview with him would have been in 1990. It was for the pilot episode of Eyewitness. Eyewitness. He was leader of the opposition. He had just finished that famous yatra of his. I interviewed him for 10 minutes. He was fine. He was happy. He gave me a cup of tea and I wandered off. Three or four months later, I witnessed came out. I met him outside by his house, watched by David Rice in in those days. And I said, oh, hello, Mr. Vani, how are you? Did you have a chance to see the interview? And he said, no, I haven't seen the interview, but I gather it was a travesty and I'm not very happy. I said, what was the problem with it? I said, it's exactly as reported and you were quite happy. You gave me a cup of tea afterwards. Anyway, he walked in, ignored me. I sent him a video of the interview and I said, please have a look at it. This is exactly as recorded. Two months went by, not a word from him. And I said, oh, to hell with him, he's not going to ring. And then one day, after the elections of 1990, do you remember? Which Narasimha Rao won. Rao yes. I got a call in the afternoon and the voice said, Karan, this is LK Advani. I said, yes, Mr. Advani. He says, you know, you were right and I were wrong. I saw that interview, it's exactly as you said it was. I was misled, I was misinformed, and I am too old at this age to be misinformed. I'm ready to apologize. And I said to myself, this is a truly great man. And I was in those days, utterly unknown. No one knew who the hell Karan was. And yet he rang up a total stranger and apologized for his behavior. And I said to myself, this is a truly great human being. Whatever his politics may be, and I may disagree with it, right? But as an individual, he's remarkable. Who knows? Narendra Modi might call you one day. 
If he does, I will happily go. As the only thing I'll do is, if he agrees to give me an interview, remember the last one ended because he said, Puche pyaas lagi hai. So this time, if he agrees to give me an interview, the first thing I'll say to him is, Modi sahab, agar aapko pyaas lagi hai, to paani pehle pi li jayega. But tell me, you're now what? You were born in 1955, so you must be what? 68. <coughs> 68 and sadly 68. getting older day by day. Yeah. Doesn't it show? <laughs> no, it doesn't show. Age is just a number. How long do you want to carry on? I'm by no means suggesting that, uh, As, you know, you're nearing retirement. No, 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 no. Just, I'll tell you. The answer, I'll what be drives very, you? I'll be, People want to know what drives you. I'll be very honest. As long as I feel I have the capacity to carry on, and that's A, the capacity to be reasonably credible in my questioning, the capacity to have the energy, and the enthusiasm and the desire to want to do it. All three exist at the moment. But there's another factor. I also carry on till the point at which people are still keen to hear me. When they feel he's gone on for too long, he's become a bow, he's become a caricature of himself, then you have to stop. And both have to go together. Has credibility taken a beating? Have you heard people say, oh, Karan, I know that you'll be anti the government, anti this, so we'll take that with a pinch I of think, salt. I think that's always been the case, not in terms of credibility, but in terms of some people liking Karan and others not. From the word go, when I first came back, there were some who thought I was aggressive, some who thought he points his finger. That at one point of time used to include my cousin Mala, who joke, you're always pointing your, your finger, finger, correct? Right? Um, but that's always been the case. And you know, there's no one on television that you like entirely. There's no one on television that you hate entirely. People evoke a mixture of emotions. And as long as they evoke emotions, you watch them. It's when there is no response at all that they evoke, that they become dull and boring. So dislike can be as forceful a reason to watch someone as admiration and liking of the person. On that note, I must confess, as I said earlier, I've known Karan. I've told you he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. Do people have views that they stick with, they hang on to? Of course, that's the nature of the beast. But I will say one thing about Karan, that decency has always been his middle name. He's utterly decent. He may, you may agree with him. You may disagree with him. You may think he's irrelevant. I, for one, don't. And I'm delighted that he chose me to be his revenge partner for this particular interview. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did and hopefully as much as Karan did. If you see, the water hasn't been touched <laughs> and he hasn't gotten up. Thank you and have a splendid day. So, Hel, can I end by saying you are a fearsome interviewer and I'm very, very glad you chose a different profession. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so indeed. much. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.